All right, so today we're going to be talking about exposing spies on macOS. As Casey mentioned, my name is Patrick. I've worked at a bunch of acronymed places. Currently, the chief security researcher at Synac. So briefly, what Synac does is basically crowdsourced vulnerability discovery. Uh, we have vetted security researchers, hackers all over the world uh, that basically work with us to hack our customers' IoT devices, network endpoints, mobile apps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if you're interested in getting paid to find a lot of easy bugs, because a lot of our customers' software is, you're probably aware, isn't that secure, uh, check out synac.com. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to start with some background concepts related to webcams and hacking webcams, and then we're going to talk about a relatively new attack which we can perform on Macs where we can piggyback onto legitimate sessions to surreptitiously record the user without any alerts. And then finally, we're going to talk about a tool I wrote to thwart this attack and how it was able to uncover some interesting behavior in a legitimate application. All right, so let's start off with some background concepts. So one of the most insidious components of a cyber attack is, in my opinion, abusing the webcam or the microphone capabilities of an unknowing user. Uh, so, you know, who's doing this? Well, hackers are, and there's a variety of ways and reasons why they're doing this. Uh, there was a good article about a year or two ago written by ours that detailed these forums where mostly guys would try to hack uh, women's computers, specifically their webcams, and then turn on the webcam to record them doing basically intimate stuff. Um, so that was a really good article kind of articulating and, and detailing that. And obviously that's going to have a really big psychological impact on, on the users and, and the people who are infected. Uh, there's also scenarios where hackers have hacked people and then recorded them doing things that they might not want to be public and then blackmailing them. So here's an example. There is a Netflix show called Black Mirror. And one of the episodes detailed how the hackers uh, were able to infect this teenage, teenager's computer and then record him while he was... Uh, pleasuring himself. Uh, and, and then with that, they basically said, hey, we're going to release this to all your friends and your family uh, unless you do all these bad things for us. So they basically blackmailed him. Um, and yes, this is a fictional show, but there have been examples where hackers have specifically done that. So obviously, webcam hacking is something that hackers are doing and it's very problematic for the infected users. Uh, our least favorite person in the world also has a quote <laughs> about uh, nation states and governments. Uh, you know, I cannot confirm or deny, but basically the quote was, governments and nation states are very interested in hacking webcams and audio capabilities as well. Uh, you know, the NSA probably isn't interested in seeing you naked, uh, at least they weren't when I was there, but you know, we could perhaps assume that they might want to turn on the audio capabilities of an infected host to see you know, what's being said. So for example, you can imagine the Russians are probably trying to, you know, if, if Trump had a laptop, I'm not sure he's smart enough to use a laptop, but if he was, <laughs> the Russians probably would want to hack it and then turn on the audio capabilities to be able to hot mic it and hear what was being said around. So that's just another capability or reasoning why people are going to go after either the webcam or the microphone. So shortly, we'll look at some Mac malware specimens that have the capability to record the user via the webcam and the microphone. Uh, but first, we'll, pro we'll talk about programmatically how to do that. So then when we look at malware samples, we can see how they do it. So it turns out, if you want to record off the mic or the webcam on Mac OS, it's pretty straightforward. So Apple provides this framework called the AV Foundation. And if we look at the slide, we can see where it sits in the software stack. And it kind of sits in the perfect place, below the applications, but above some of the more low-level, C-based, older, deprecated um, frameworks. So this is nice because it's powerful enough, but then also has a nice, level, nice levels of abstraction to make it really easy to do. So if you're interested in reading all the specs of the protocol and the framework details, you can just Google the name, AV Foundation Pro Programming Guide. And now we'll look at how to do this programmatically. Now you might be wondering, hey, are there any stipulations or requirements for accessing either the mic or the webcam? And the answer to that is yes, but only if you're an application from the Mac App Store. And if you are an application from the Mac App Store, what you need is a special requirement saying, I'm going to be allowed to use the camera. 
but it turns out this is an entitlement you can give yourself. So as a developer, if you're developing an application for the Mac App Store, uh, in Xcode you basically say, I'm gonna use the App Sandbox, which you have to if you're gonna distribute yourself in the Mac App Store. And then you check the camera checkbox that will add the com.apple.security.device.camera entitlement to your application. This tells the operating system, hey, this application from the Mac App Store is allowed to use the webcam. Now again, since this is something you can give to your own application, unless Apple blocks this, which I've never heard them doing, this is really not a showstopper, right? It's not an obstacle. Now, even more importantly though, applications that <clears throat> are distributed outside the Mac App Store, which is essentially all Mac malware, doesn't have to have any entitlements. So this means it can access the webcam, it can access the mic with no pop-ups from the operating system, uh, you know, and no necessarily confirmation from the user. All right, so we're gonna now walk through a simple example of how to do this programmatically. It turns out it's pretty simple. So this is based on a sample called Video Snap that's available on GitHub. And this is just kind of the, the main interface for our code. You can see we do two things. We set up a signal handler, and this is just because this is a command line based application. So when we hit command C to exit the application, we have to do a bit, little bit of cleanup to flush out the video recording. And then we <clears throat> initialize this video snap object and call record on it. So let's look what this record function does. So it does pretty much <clears throat> three things. It gets the default video device. Uh, this is probably gonna be the built-in webcam, unless there's an attached webcam to the system. Then it creates a bunch of AV foundation objects. For example, an uh, AV capture session, an AV capture movie file output, and an AV capture device input object. <clears throat> and then it adds those input and output devices to the session. And then it calls the start recording to output file URL. So if you execute this code, this will start recording off the webcam on the Mac. Now the LED indicator light will go on, and we'll talk more about that. But you can see it's pretty much 10 lines of code to start recording off uh, the user's webcam. Now we have to add some code to handle stopping and finalizing the session as well. So we do that in the signal handler that we set up. So again, this is a command line application. Uh, it's gonna start recording off the webcam. As soon as you hit uh, control C to exit, our signal handler will catch that signal and basically calls stop recording which then calls a delegate method, which is did finish recording output file at URL. So this is automatically called by the operating system when you call stop recording. And then here we just call stop running. And what this will do is this will just close out the file, flush out any remaining frames, and then end result we'll have a video file that we can play back, open in quick time, et cetera. So we compile and run this. We can see it finds the default built-in video device webcam, which is called FaceTime HD Camera. That's the internal name for the webcam on Max. Starts capturing until we hit Control C. This will trigger our delegate method, and then that will write that out to file. And then if we run, for example, the file command, we can see we have a movie file that we can play. So again, this is exactly how you record off the webcam on Mac. Now if you're interested in recording audio as well, it's pretty much exactly the same. Again, you use AV Foundation, and you just have to find the built-in or default microphone, which again, you can use via, uh, do via the same method. You call uh, device input, uh, add, sorry, device input with device, and you pass in uh, the audio device. And this turn, we then, it finds the built-in microphone, starts recording off the mic, and then when we hit Control C, it will write that out to disk. And of course you can combine both in the same code so that you can record audio and video in the same time. Now one important thing for the microphone, there's gonna be no indication at all. So there's no LED indicator that comes on, nothing. Like someone could have hacked my MacBook, perhaps they're recording off the mic right now, there's no way for me to know that. All right, so we've mentioned the LED indicator light uh, a few times, and, and whenever we talk about hacking webcams, this is really kind of the big question, right? You go on any hacker forum, once they're talking about you know, gaining access to people's computers and recording them via the webcam, it's always like, how do I turn off the LED indicator light? And as we all know, once the webcam is activated, the LED indicator light will come on. And this is obviously for privacy reasons, and it's a good idea. So is it hackable, is it easy to turn off? Well, as the question on Reddit said, uh, you know, this isn't really that much of a scientific response, but I think it captures the idea, which is it's a very difficult thing to actually disable. 
Uh, we'll see the architecture of the Mac webcams in a second, but basically it's a separate device on a separate chip that cannot be accessed directly from software. So unless an adversary has physical access to your device and some sophisticated capabilities, they're probably not gonna be able to turn off the webcam from a software-based exploit. Now, nothing is impossible. Turns out that older versions of Macs were susceptible to an attack that allowed a, uh, an attacker to turn off the LED indicator light from user mode via software, which is really not ideal. So this research came out of John Hopkins, uh, and they wrote a great paper called ICU, Disabling the MacBook Webcam Indicator LED. And what they did was they first described the architecture of the device, and here we can see there's basically four parts. There's a host computer, which talks to a USB controller. The USB controller is a Cypress Easy USB, and this is just a microcontroller that communicates with an image sensor, which is what is actually capturing the images the, from the webcam, via IO pins. And then we can see there's this LED indicator light that's directly attached via hardware to one of these uh, input pins. So what their attack did, it was actually fairly simple, albeit very elegant. Uh, they noticed or found out that they could actually reprogram the firmware on that USB controller. And once they were able to do that, they were then able to reconfigure the image sensor. So what they did basically was they said, image sensor, ignore the standby pin. So that top line is, is kind of the stand, standby uh, I.O. pin. And basically what the LED indicator light is, it will go on when standby is off. So standby basically means the webcam is off, it's powered off. So whenever the standby pin is set, the webcam is gonna be, uh, the LED indicator light is gonna be off. When standby is off, meaning there's power to the webcam and it's recording, the LED indicator light is gonna go on. So basically they just said, we're always gonna keep standby on, meaning that according to the LED indicator light, it's never gonna think that the device is powered, but then it's gonna tell the image sensor, which is what is capturing the image, to ignore that standby and still record off the device. So the end result was they were able to, from user mode, reprogram the USB controller and then record off the webcam without the LED indicator light coming on. So this was obviously a really nice attack, very problematic. And I believe the way Apple fixed it was, uh, I think they require the firmware to be signed now, or I'm not even sure it's updatable. So it's completely separate. Uh, so kind of surprising that this actually worked, but good news is more modern Macs uh, are not susceptible to this attack. All right, so what can you do to protect your webcam? Well, the most obvious thing is just put tape over this. Uh, you know, and that's a great kind of low level of sophistication, but will block people from spying uh, via the webcam. Other options, you can buy webcam covers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's also software options. I'm not really a fan of this method, but we're gonna mention it here for completeness. Uh, one method which was described online is basically to set the uh, permissions for all the plugins that the webcam uses to be readable only by root. So then when an application like Facebook, uh, FaceTime, or Skype tries to access the camera, it'll get an access denied and won't be able to talk to the camera. Now the problem with this is obviously if the malware has root privileges, it can change these permissions, or if it's running in kernel mode, it can directly talk to the webcam itself. Now the LED indicator light will go on, but this preventative mechanism won't actually thwart malware in that scenario. Okay, so that was some general webcam background concepts. Uh, I mentioned that there is some Mac malware out there that tries to record the user, either via the webcam or the mic, and now we're gonna look at these samples. Now for all of these samples, they're really not that sophisticated, so when they go to record the user via the webcam, the LED indicator light is gonna come on. And in my opinion, this is like a massive giveaway, right? If you're like sitting at your computer, eating lunch or something, and all of a sudden the LED indicator light comes on, like you're gonna probably suspect that you're hacked, rightfully so. So the first piece of Mac malware that I'm aware of that used webcam, audio, video recording capabilities was Hacking Team's implant. Hacking Team was, or is, um, an Italian offensive cybersecurity company that sold uh, cyber capabilities to a variety of governments. A uh, year or two ago, they got spectacularly hacked and all the source code for their tools was released to the internet, which is really nice. As malware analysts, we don't normally have access to source code, so when we do, it makes things a lot easier. 
General capabilities, it was all about gathering intelligence and information. So you can see, for example, the list of modules, grab things from the calendar, uh, did screenshot, audio and video, grab stuff from the clipboard, etc. So here's actually the code that's responsible for recording off the webcam. So this is Hacking Team's Mac implant, and this is the code that would be executed to record the user. It's in a file named rcsmagentwebcam.m. And we can see that they're actually not using the AV Foundation, but using Apple's QTKit. And QTKit QT is just an older framework that allows you to record off the webcam. It's now deprecated. Hacking Team's code was very old, so it's likely that at the time they were just more familiar with that API or that framework, and thus we're using uh, QT. Again, once this code is executed, yes, it will start recording the user, but the LED indicator light will come on, which again, kind of a giveaway. They also had the ability <clears throat> to separately turn on the microphone and start recording. It's kind of nice that these were decoupled because again, they might not want to turn on that LED indicator light, but record the user at least via audio. So this was implemented in the rcsmagentmicrophone.m file. And again, they didn't use AV Foundation or QTKit, but used something called Audio Q Services. Again, this is just a very old deprecated API that Apple provides that allows you to record off the microphone. Again, you see it's three or four lines of code. They basically get access to the microphone and then call audio Q start to start pulling audio off the microphone. So again, when this is executed, they'll be able to record what's going on around the user without any indication. Now a more recent sample is called Eleanor. This was discovered last July by Bitdefender. Eleanor is distributed uh, outside the Mac App Store, so via the internet. Basically what the attackers did is they found an abandoned application called EasyDoc Converter and created a new version of this that had some malicious capabilities, basically. It was Trojaned. They then uploaded this to a very common uh, app website called MacUpdate.com. It's a legitimate website where users go to get applications. So when users would then go to this website, macupdate.com, and look for a document converter application, if they grabbed this and downloaded it, they would have then just become infected with Eleanor. So in terms of its capabilities, it basically exposed the PHP-based web uh, backdoor to the attacker via Tor. Uh, the PHP web backdoor was actually open source. So really nothing that sophisticated, but again allowed the remote adversary complete control over an infected user's Mac computer. Interestingly, the malware also contains some capabilities, so it was distributed, for example, with uh, Netcat, and also something called Waka. Uh, what Waka is, it's an open source utility, kind of an old one, but does allow the user to be recorded via the webcam and via the mic. So again, the, uh, the PHP back, uh, backdoor allowed the attacker to execute arbitrary commands. Since the malware was distributed with this Waka executable, this binary, the attacker could then execute that and start recording the user. Again, really not that sophisticated. The LED indicator light would go on. But again, this is just another piece of Mac malware that did have the capability to record the infected user. Another one is Mox. This was discovered last September by Kaspersky. And this is a cross-platform backdoor that had a, some pretty interesting capabilities. Again, it looked like it was designed maybe not by cyber criminals, but perhaps by attackers that were more interested in gathering intelligence. So it had basic capabilities like downloading and executing commands. Uh, had some neat things, for example, to search for office documents and exfiltrate them. Had the ability to capture uh, the screen, audio, and video. And then also actually monitored for USB devices. So if the user would plug in a USB device, the malware could enumerate that and grab files of interest off that. So again, kind of an interesting capability, not something we see that often, especially in Mac malware. So if we look at the disassembly for this, because we don't have uh, source code, we can see that it makes use of Qt, which is a cross-platform um, framework that allows people to record off the audio and microphone capabilities of an infected computer. Now this makes sense because there's a Windows version of this as well. So by using Qt, the malware could just call into Qt and then Qt would abstract all the OS specific uh, APIs and methods. So obviously, the, you know, on Mac, this was gonna have the Mac specific code. It would talk to AV Foundation. On Windows, it would be doing different stuff. But the malware authors wouldn't have to worry about that because they were using the cross-platform framework. So here we can basically see uh, the code for that 
and them calling into the Qt APIs to <coughs> start recording the user. And again, the LED indicator light would go on. Finally, we've got Fruitfly. This was the first piece of Mac malware that was discovered in 2017. It was kind of interesting because it actually looks like a very old piece of Mac malware that's probably just been undetected for a decade plus. So for example, the component it persists is actually an obfuscated Perl script. Like, you really don't see that that much, especially in Mac malware. Uh, embedded within this Perl script was a Mako binary executable. So the uh, attacker could send command and control commands down to this piece of malware, and one of the commands would be to drop that embedded mock O executable and execute capabilities within it. And one of these commands was to tell the malware to start recording off the webcam. And again, they didn't use AV foundation, they used QuickTime. QuickTime APIs are incredibly old and deprecated. Uh, there's no 64-bit version of them. Apple has removed the header files from recent versions of the SDK. So again, this likely indicates that this malware is very, very old. Um, and the reason, again, they use the QuickTime APIs is because that was what was available to the malware authors at the time, or that's just what they were familiar with. But it still works. So if you do compile a piece of code, it's got to be a 32-bit binary, but you can then record off the webcam or the microphone via the QuickTime APIs. And again, this will cause the LED indicator light to go on. All right, so that was some recent Mac malware samples that were webcam or audio aware. So I was looking at these, I was like, okay, these are kind of interesting. I mean, it's kind of a cool capability, but I was really bothered by the fact that anytime they recorded the user, the LED light would go on. I mean, that's kind of a dead giveaway, and in my, cap in my mind, I didn't think that was a, a good thing to do from the malware author's point of view. So first, let's make an observation about Mac web cams. And if you're a Mac user, yes, you can put tape over your Mac webcam, but you probably do use your Mac webcam for a variety of actions. Um, so you know, if you work remotely, you might call in for a business meeting with the board. Uh, if you work for you know an R and D team, you might have an R and D meeting talking about what you're working on. You might be skyping with security teams talking about zero day vulnerabilities or talking to the media. Or, you know, you might be talking to someone via FaceTime, have an intimate session, whatever. And the observation here is that these are the things that an attacker is probably going to be interested as well. So I do most of these, well, the first three at least, on pretty much any given day. Uh, you know, talk to my company, uh, maybe talk to Apple's security team about some vulnerabilities I found. And again, if an attacker is recording off my Mac computer, uh, all the day, they're gonna see me like picking my nose, petting my dog, like really boring stuff. But this is probably what they want, this is the information they wanna capture anyways. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna describe an attack, or rather a feature, that allows us to detect when the webcam is legitimately in use. So like, oh, Patrick's calling Apple security team or something like that. And then detect that and then piggyback onto that existing session to record the user without any other indications. So pretty much three steps. We're gonna wait until the user starts a legitimate webcam session. Then we're going to detect this and piggyback onto that session. And then we're going to be able to exfiltrate that recording. So we're pretty much just gonna focus <clears throat> on step number two because that's the most interesting from a technical point of view. So the first thing we, or the malware needs to do is enumerate or find the built-in webcam. So we talked about this already, but just to reiterate, you can use AV Foundation and execute just a few lines of code. So here we execute the devices with media type. We pass in AV media type video, and this will return us an array of all the attached webcam devices. And then we can enumerate over these. We can look for the built-in one. We can look for one that matches by name. Basically though, this will give us a reference to the device. So here you see when we execute this code, it gives us a reference to the built-in webcam, which is, again, the FaceTime HD camera. Okay, so now we have reference to this camera. What we can do is register for notifications. And the notification we're gonna register for is the on-off notification. So we can do this via the CMIO object add property listener block. And this takes a variety of parameters. It takes a connection ID. This is a private instance variable attached to the reference of the camera. But since Objective-C allows us to kind of poke around at objects, we can get access to this private instance variable. 
And then the other thing it, pass, it takes is uh, the notification we're interested in, which is the on-off notification, and then a block of code that will be executed whenever that notification fires. So once we execute this, we've basically registered with the operating system and say, hey, please execute our callback code anytime any application utilizes the webcam. So what does that notification handler actually do? Well, basically what it does is it just queries the webcam to see if it's on or off. And the reason we have to do this is because there's not a separate off and on notification. It's the same notification. So when we get this notification, we have to say, hey, is this because the webcam was activated or is it because the user shut it off? We don't really care about it being shut off. We care about when it's activated. So we basically just ask the webcam or query the system and say, is the state of the webcam activated? And this will come back with a yes or no. Uh, if it's yes, meaning it is activated, we can kick off recording because we know that the user has just initiated a legitimate webcam session. So now we noticed, or we, we, we have a notification, we now know that the user is activated the webcam. We know that the LED indicator light is already on. And what we can now do is initiate our own malicious or surreptitious recording. And the reason this works is because the webcam is a shared resource. So like you can legitimately like Skype and FaceTime and take pictures via photo booth all at the same time. Like I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but you can. There's no such thing as the application having exclusive access or a lock on the webcam. So because it's shared, that means that our malware can piggyback onto that session as well. So what we can then do is we know the webcam has been activated. We know it's a shared device. So what we can do is just start recording. And we can do that with the AV Foundation APIs that we discussed earlier. So again, you can see we do it in like 10 lines of code. So we execute this and we'll start pulling frames off the webcam. The LED indicator light is already on, so there'll be no other indication to the user. Now equally important, we need to know when the webcam is deactivated. Because if the user say they're having like an intimate FaceTime session and then they're done and the LED indicator light still stays on because we're surreptitiously recording off in the background, that will be a giveaway that their computer is probably hacked. So we can't rely on that notification, the on off one, because since we're recording, there's never going to be an off notification until we stop as well. So what we can do, and we'll talk about this in a second, is we can identify the consumer process or the initial application that initiated the recording off the webcam, and then just monitor that application until it exits. There's a variety of ways to do that. One is basically you register for an NS workspace notification. So say we've identified that FaceTime was the application that initial, initialized or initiated the webcam session. We can just monitor for that, and then when that application is terminated, we can know that the user has closed their session, and we can stop recording so that the LED indicator light goes off as well. So again, pretty easy to do in code. All right, so that's the attack from malware's point of view. It's pretty awesome uh, for a variety of reasons. First, it's Apple approved. And what I mean by that is we're abusing legitimate capabilities of the operating system. These are my favorite kinds of attack because, you know, it's not something that Apple can, like, patch out, right? We're not exploiting a buffer overflow or a memory corruption vulner vulnerability. Uh, we're just abusing legitimate capabilities, the fact that the webcam is a shared device. If Apple says the webcam isn't a shared device, this would break a lot of legitimate applications. So one cool thing about the attack. The other thing is you don't have to be root. You can just be any application running on the operating system to monitor the webcam, piggyback onto the session. You don't need any special permissions. You can, ask, you can also always record even if the user is just using the webcam to broadcast themselves. So like when I'm talking to someone via webcam, I'm not like recording myself, but that doesn't matter from the operating system's point of view. There's no secondary indication LED light or something that says, oh, something is now recording you versus <clears throat> just broadcasting you. And then finally, it's kind of invisible in the sense that, as I mentioned, there's no secondary indication. So kind of a cool capability. All right. So I'm a Mac user. I've drank the Apple juice. I love all my Apple products. Um, but you know, I was kind of bothered by the fact that it was pretty easy for some malware to, you know, pull off this uh, attack. You know, when I'm using my webcam to talk to people, like, I don't want malware recording that. And there are some tools that can tell you, for example, when your webcam is activated, that's kind of pointless because the LED indicator light comes on. So there wasn't any tools that could tell you if there was any malware pulling off this piggybacking attack or 
there wasn't actually even any tools that would tell you what application triggered the LED indicator light to come on. So again, if you had been infected by one of the Mac malware samples I talked about and the LED indicator light randomly came on, there was no tool that would identify what process basically triggered that light to come on. So I decided to write a tool that would address these issues. And the goal of the tool is pretty simple. Basically, I want to be alerted any time the webcam is activated. I want the tool to identify what process is activated the webcam or the mic. And then if anything piggybacks, any secondary consumer process jumps onto that session, I want to be alerted of that fact as well. So we can do this in three simple steps. And we'll describe each of these. So we can monitor for the camera or the microphone to be activated. We can then identify the consumer process, that is the process or application that the user is using to initiate the legitimate session, or it might be some malware that's not that sophisticated that's initiating that session as well. And then we can monitor the webcam while it's being used to detect if any secondary process piggybacks onto the session, perhaps for malicious reasons. So the, the tool is called Oversight, uh, and it's free, and it's able to detect exactly what we just described. And we'll kind of dive into the technical way it does that in a second. But just the overview of the tool, it just runs as a little menu bar icon. You can also run it without the menu bar icon. Just sits in the background and it will give you an alert whenever, um, you know, something uses your webcam. And then you can block it, you can whitelist it, et cetera, et cetera. So the more interesting thing, at least to me, is how this all works under the hood. So there's two pieces to oversight. There's a UI component, which is just a login item. This is automatically started whenever you log in, runs with normal user permissions, sits in the uh, status bar, and what it does is it can monitor for audio video activations, and then since it's running in the UI session, it will also be responsible for generating the UI alert when it detects a process using the mic or the webcam, or something piggybacking onto the webcam. It also talks to a piece of code which is an XPC service that runs as root. Now the reason we need this authorized piece of code running at higher privileges is for two reasons. First, in order to find what application is actually using the, the mic or the camera, we kind of have to do some trickery, which we'll talk about, re which requires root permissions. And then also if the user wants to kill the process that's using the webcam or the mic, that might have to be done via root. For example, if there's a piece of malware that's running as root that turns on the webcam, this code will detect that, but when the user clicks block, that needs to be killed via root because the malware itself is being run as root. So probably one of the coolest features of the tool is the ability to identify what application is using the webcam or the mic. And the reason this is kind of somewhat complicated is because Apple doesn't provide any direct API or mechanism to do this. So yes, it'll tell you, hey, the webcam was activated, so it'll invoke our notification handler that we registered, but it won't give us a PID, it won't give us a process name, it won't say, yeah, it was FaceTime, or oh, it was Skype, or oh, it's this new, new piece of malware. So what we have to do is kind of in, uh, indirectly figure out how to do this. So the way we can do this is whenever an application accesses the webcam, under the hood a mock message is sent to the camera assistant process. A mock message is just an IPC mechanism and this is generated by the operating system. So what Oversight can do is basically monitor for such mock messages and then when it sees one, it knows already that the webcam has been activated and it can then identify what application is using the webcam based on monitoring these mock messages. Now it does a few other things to reduce any potential first positives, uh, false positives. For example, it can then uh, analyze the process that's sent in the mock message. So it can do things that look for loaded libraries, it can look, for example, at thread backtraces and say, yes, this candidate application is actually really currently using the webcam. So then it's able to tell the user, hey, it's Skype, or oh, hey, it's this, you know, hacking team piece of malware that's using the webcam. So I released version 1.0 last year and it turned out to be really popular. I think the coolest thing is for a while when you Googled oversight, it would come up before the, uh, you know, the oversight committee. Uh, so that was kind of neat. But version 1.0 definitely had some limitations, at least in terms of feature. So it couldn't identify what process was using the mic because it turns out that was even more difficult to do than de determining who was using the webcam. There was also no whitelisting. So say you use FaceTime a lot or Skype, 
you know, you get a pop-up every time saying FaceTime is using the camera and you'd be like, okay, I got it. And then there was also no command line interface if you wanted to deploy it or install it maybe in a corporate environment. So I recently released Oversight 1.1 and it has a bunch of better, cooler features. It's now more comprehensive. So the first thing it can do, which a lot of users requested, which makes sense, is it can identify what process is using the mic. Again, we can do this similarly in the way that we identify who's using the webcam. Uh, whenever an application or a process accesses the mic and starts recording off it, this generates a mock message sent to the core audio daemon. So again, Oversight has registered for webcam and mic notifications. It gets a notification from the operating system saying, hey, someone activated the mic. It can then monitor and see who sent mock messages to the core audio daemon. And then once it has that, it can again look at stack traces, it can query the IO registry, and then very comprehensively and very accurately identify what process is using the mic. Another feature now is you can whitelist processes. This just makes it more usable. So anytime an application accesses the mic or the webcam for the first time, if you click allow, it'll basically just ask you, hey, do you always want to allow it or do you want to just allow it this time? And if you allow it, always it will whitelist the process. So this is really nice for things like Skype, FaceTime, that you'll legitimately use the mic or the camera for. All right, so since we have some time, I want to now talk about a rather interesting case study where oversight revealed some rather interesting behavior in a widespread application. So it all started with email. Uh, one of my users pinged me and said, thanks for oversight. Uh, I was able to figure out why my Mac, my mic was always spying on me. Just to let you know that Shazam widget keeps the microphone active even when you specifically switch the toggle to off in their app. Scary. So that was interesting, kind of piqued my interest. Uh, at the time I was flying to Echo Party, which is an awesome conference in um, Argentina, and I was stuck on a 15 hour flight. Um, but you know, I kind of actually like being stuck on planes for a long time because I'm really easily distracted by things on the internet. Um, and on a plane, you know, the internet doesn't really work, so I, you know, have a lot of time to poke on these things. So I decided, hey, got some extra time, let me look at what Shazam is doing. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of what Shazam is, but in case you're not, it's basically an application that can identify what song is playing. So basically when you grab it, for example, from the Mac App Store, because we're talking just about the Mac version of the application here, when you install it, it basically installs uh, a little piece of code and then when you turn it on, uh, it'll obviously turn on the microphone so that it can restart, start listening to what audio is being played and then it will submit that data to the cloud and identify what song you're listening to. So again. Shazam. Not that uh, interesting yet. But turns out when I installed it and turned the mic off, I didn't get any deactivation alert from Oversight. So when I turned Shazam on, Oversight said, hey, Shazam is using the mic, which makes sense, nothing surprising there. But again, turned it off, there was no deactivation alert. And Oversight will always give you a deactivation alert when the webcam and the mic is then turned off. So I said, hey, two options, right? My code sucks or there's a bug or perhaps Shazam is still listening. And I was more leaning toward my code having a bug. I'm more of a hacker versus a software engineer. But either way, I wanted to get to the bottom of it to figure out if there wasn't my bug in the code to fix it or if, you know, Shazam was really listening. So let's start by talking about Shazam's components. Whenever I reverse engineer an application, it's good to understand kind of the different parts, the different binaries, frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. So when you install Shazam, if you have a utility like Block Block, which we'll talk about uh, briefly later, it will alert you saying, hey, Shazam is installing a persistent component. Nothing too surprising here. Shazam is basically just setting itself up to be automatically started whenever you log in. And this is something you can toggle off. So if we look at how they're doing this, we can look at their application bundle. And in the application bundle, we can see that there's a folder in the library slash login items directory, there's a file called Shazam Helper. And if you read some online documentation, this is how you legitimately create a piece of code that will be automatically executed by the operating system whenever you log in. If you're interested in the details, there's a link on the blog kind of describing that. So this basically means when you log in, Shazam is going to execute this application or this binary called Shazam Helper. So we can reverse engineer it and see what it does. 
So we have some disassembly on the one side, pseudocode on the other side. It turns out pretty much does two things. It builds a URL and then opens that URL. And this will then trigger the main Shazam application to be executed. Now you might be wondering how does opening a URL trigger another application to be executed? For example, how does opening Shazam Mac like open the actual Shazam application? So if we look at the Shazam application, specifically its info.plist, which is a property list file that has information about the application, we can see that it's registered for a variety of URLs. So specifically, we, if we look at the CF bundle URL schemes array, we can see that it's regi registered for the Shazam Mac URL. So basically what it's doing is it's telling the operating system, hey, I'm gonna register myself for these URLs, if any application opens a URL of this type or this scheme, please invoke or execute or launch me to handle that. So that's exactly what's happening here. The helper application executes Shazam Mac slash launch. The operating system looks up who's responsible for handling that, which is the main Shazam application, and then executes the main Shazam application. So this is just how Shazam is automatically launched when you log in. So we now know the main application is what is being run, and so we can assume that it's probably responsible for toggling the switch on and off when the user says no, stop listing, or yes, start identifying audio. So what we can do is we want to figure out what code is executed when that little toggle switch is toggled on or off to reveal either was there a bug in my code or was Shazam really not turning itself off when the user toggled to off. Now Shazam is a Mac application, and Mac applications are generally written in Swift or Objective-C, which are ver both very verbose. Because of the way the Objective-C runtime works, there's a lot of like messages that are passed around, and those are done by names. So what you can do is actually in a compiled binary, there's a ton of information. For example, method names, instant vari instance variable names, which makes reverse engineering actually pretty easy. So we can use a utility like class dump and dump all this information. So if we execute class dump on the main Shazam application, we can see that there's a method or a function called toggle auto tagging. Yeah, this seems like a good place to start. So what we do is we can attach to the main Shazam application via a debugger or start it under, under a debugger. And we use LLDB. LLDB is kind of the de facto Apple debugger for debugging applications and all things Apple. And we can set a breakpoint on this toggle auto tagging method. And once this is set, we can go back into the UI and toggle the switch on and off. And turns out this will cause the debugger to break at this breakpoint. So, you know, hooray, we've basically figured out what code is executed when the user toggles that on and off. So now we're at this breakpoint, we can start poking around. So the table I have on the slide talks about what register values or the registers and what they hold when you hit a breakpoint on an Objective-C method call. So for example, we can see RDI has the class name, RSI has the method name, which is a string, and then RDX is the first argument. So in the debugger, we can dump these, and we can see, yes, RSI contains the toggle auto tagging method, which makes sense, because this is the breakpoint where we set. And then RDI is this instance of an IT switch object which kind of makes sense, right? We have this switch toggle thing. This is just the method or the object name that Shazam decided to give to the way they represent that switch. And since we have an instance or we have a reference to that instance, we can execute, ob uh, execute methods on that in the debugger. So for example, we can call the isOn method and it comes back and says no, which makes sense because we've just turned it off. So again, this just says, hey, we're in the right place. We have access to the right object that the user's toggling. Like we're off to a good start. So if the user toggles the switch to off, if we look at the disassembling, disassembly, we can see that the toggle auto tagging method invokes a whole bunch of different methods. Basically the only one we need to worry about is at the bottom. So at the bottom we can see that it calls a method which is should stop recording when tagging ends. And then if this method returns true, and remember that because that's important, it will invoke stop recording. So you look at this, you're like, okay, this makes sense. Users, you know, switch the switch to off. It's eventually gonna call stop recording. Everything appears good. 
if we reverse this stop recording method, we can see it calls into Apple's AV foundation, specifically the audio output unit stop function. And Apple basically says, hey, this stops IO, uh, IO processing, basically meaning, yes, if this method is called, it'll stop recording. So again, everything seems reasonable. This is the code that it appears that Shazam calls when the user toggles the switch to off. But remember, stop recording is only called if should stop recording when tagging ends returns true. So let's look at this method. So if we reverse engineer it, this is a disassembly. We can see it's like three lines of disassembly. All it does is check a variable called tagging type. And if tagging type is set to true, or two rather, the number two, it returns yes or true. Otherwise, it returns false. So we can set a breakpoint at this method, and when it gets called, we can examine the value of that variable to see if it's set to two or not, meaning the, that, that uh, method will return either true or false. And we can actually see it's set to one, which means that this method returns false, which means the stop recording method is not called. So that's odd. Now, whenever I reverse engineer something, I'm rarely 100% sure that, you know, what I figured out is necessarily the, you know, absolute truth. So I thought maybe this tagging type variable is set to two, you know, when you're not on an airplane or when the internet is connected or when you're not debugging, right? Is there some scenario where it's set to true, meaning that method will, will return yes or true, meaning stop recording will be stopped? So I looked for code that would set or modify this tagging type variable. And there was only one place, and it was hard-coded to one, which is not two, meaning that method will never return true, meaning stop record will never be called. And then since we're in a debugger and we have references to various Shazam objects, we can actually query those. And so one of these methods or objects has a method called isRecording. So we can invoke this in the debugger. So I turn Shazam off and then invoke this method, and it came back and says yes. So this is basically Shazam saying, yeah, I know you turned it off, but yes, I'm still recording. That is a very helpful method. So at this point, I felt pretty confident. I said, hey, Shazam, like, what gives, like, you know, you're recording when it's off? And they came back and they basically said, yeah, we are. And we're doing this for, like, optimization reasons. Uh, basically, their logic was that, you know, when you come back and you return it back on, you want to know what the song is right away, right? You don't want to have to wait three seconds. So let's just always record in the background. You know, it's a trade-off between usability and security, privacy. Yeah, very, very common. Now, there's a few things to note. Uh, you know, this isn't quite as bad as, you know, the media made it out. First, this is only the Mac application. Uh, what I think happened was they designed the iOS application to always listen and then ported it at a later time to the Mac. Now, in iOS, when you background an application, it's going to stop recording, as far as I know. So they don't really have to worry about turning off the mic on iOS. But on, on, on the Mac, that app is always running. There's not the concept of backgrounding an application, so it's always pulling off the mic, even if it's off. The only thing is, though, once they pull data off that, they're not actually sending that to the cloud. So yes, they are continuing to record audio off the microphone, but they're not actually processing it. So what that off switch kind of does, it sets another variable, which is called generating. It's a generate flag. And they check that. And if that's set to true, meaning the user's turned it off, they don't actually send it to the cloud. So yes, they're still recording, but they're not actually processing. So it's like, eh, kind of gray. So, you know, I, like I said, I told Shazam about this, and they basically said, like, GTFO, this is a usability feature. And I was like, okay, cool. So I wrote a technical blog, trying not to, you know, make too big of a deal. Media picked this up. They're like, former NSA guy figures out Shazam's always listening. And I'm like, all right, thanks, media. I mean, you know, we all love the attention. But the positive thing was it got Shazam to actually change their mind. So, you know, sometimes press is a, a good thing. Uh, so basically, Shazam released a new version of the application once they got all this bad media. And what they basically did is they say, OK, now when you turn off the off switch, we'll stop listening, which, you know, cool. So that was kind of a happy ending for me. Like, I was happy that eventually they updated their application. I mean, I'm not going to install it on my Mac anyways, but a lot of users do use it. And now it's nice to know that when it's off, it's really not going to be recording off the micro microphone. All right, so let's briefly wrap that up. Uh, we got a few minutes still, so I just briefly want to talk about generic detections. And the reason I want to talk about this is, well, first we showed that generic detections can be really powerful. For example, they can tell you, 
hey, an application like Shazam, which isn't malicious, is always listening. So the generic detection there is, tell me any time any application is using the mic or the webcam, right? We're not looking for specific malware signatures. Also, Mac AV products currently are pretty weak. Uh, the Windows ones are a lot better, right? A lot of them have more advanced heuristics, but the problem is there's not that parity on the Mac side of the house. I mean, we can all bypass these antivirus products anyways, but on Mac it's incredibly easy. They mostly just use static signatures. If you don't believe me, just wait till a new Mac malware sample is discovered, hop on something like VirusTotal and see how many AV products detect it. There was actually just one last night that was detected, brand new, zero AV signatures, right? And for all of us here, that's really not that surprising. But again, as a Mac user, I want to kind of have more powerful security tools that perhaps tell me when something is using the webcam. So the first observation is that most Mac, if not all Mac malware persists. And what persistence means in the context of this presentation is that it installs its way itself in some way that it'll be automatically restarted whenever the system is rebooted or when the user logs in. Obviously if it doesn't persist and the user shuts down the computer, the malware has just lost its foothold onto the system and the attacker would probably have to re-exploit the user again. So pretty much all public Mac malware persists in some way, so what we can do is simply monitor or enumerate those persistence locations and then generically detect such malware. So the first tool I wrote is called Knock Knock, I've talked about this before, it's just like auto runs on Windows but for Mac OS. So it enumerates persistence locations and tells you what's installed there. It doesn't try to tell you if something's malware, but it shows if something is signed, it does query virus total, which can be useful if it's known malware. Um, but what I normally do is I run this on a system if I think it's infected and look for things I don't recognize or, you know, something that claims to be uh, an Apple binary that isn't signed by Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Another tool is called Block Block and this just monitors those persistence locations. So it's kind of like a firewall for the places that malware can persist. So anytime any software goes to persist itself, uh, it'll get, give you a pop-up and then you can block it or allow it. Obviously if you're installing something legitimate, you know, you're going to allow it because it's going to be your installer. Uh, but if you're just like browsing the web or you open a Word document and then it pops up to tell you, hey, some new cron job was just installed, uh, you know, that's probably something you want to know about. Another interesting generic detection is detecting ransomware. Uh, this is kind of a big epidemic. I don't think it necessarily has to be. And this is because all ransomware pretty much does the same thing, which is encrypt files. So what we can do is simply monitor the file system and look for the rapid creation of encrypted, process, encrypted files by untrusted processes. So as soon as we see a bunch of encrypted files happening, we can just basically alert the user and say, hey, like, are you cool with this happening? Um, and of course we filter out things like binaries signed by Apple, um, you know, unless they've been executed by an untrusted ancestor. Uh, there was some Mac malware, for example, that uh, encrypted a ransom files via the zip application, basically encrypt, created password encrypted zip archives. But again, we can still detect that and determine, you know, something odd or something suspicious is in encrypting that. So another tool called ransomware, and basically it just monitors the file system, runs in the background, and anytime it sees something rapidly creating encrypted files, it just alerts the user and says, hey, this is happening. Now yes, most users are probably going to click allow anyways, but eh, at least now they've been warned. All right, so these tools are all free, so I hope this doesn't sound like a sales pitch. Uh, basically these are the security tools I run on my Mac to keep um, them secure. Uh, you know, when I go to Russia I still take a burner laptop, but you know, as I'm browsing the web I kind of like having uh, an extra sense of um, some extra security, obviously knowing that it's still possible to get hacked. Uh, so if you're interested in Mac security, Tools are all free. I also post all the Mac malware samples that are publicly uh, discussed. A lot of the antivirus companies will write really good technical write-ups but then don't share the sample. So I get those samples and then make them available because I think that, you know, sharing is caring and we should be able to poke on, uh, on these samples. I also love to blog, uh, so if you're interested in uh, Apple Zero Days, things like Shazam spying on you, I try to uh, write up technical blog stuff about that because I'm unfortunately stuck on planes a lot. All right, so that's a wrap. Uh, again, I really appreciate you attending. If you're interested in joining the Synac Red Team, again, they're sponsoring this uh, 
conference, so very thankful for that. Uh, go to synac.com slash red team. Uh, otherwise, if you have any questions about Mac security, hit me up anytime. I really geek out on this stuff, so I love uh, chatting about it. So I think we have about five minutes or so for questions. Lunch is next, so if you ask less questions, you can eat lunch sooner. So don't forget. <laughs> I'll also be around the rest of the day, so if you want to just come up and uh, bug me, that would be cool too. Yes, question in front. Uh, I noticed one tool was missing there. It's not your tool, but Little Flocker. How do you feel about that? Yeah, so the question was uh, Little Flocker. Little Flocker is actually a great uh, security tool. Uh, it kind of does a good thing because it combines several of capabilities that my tool have into one tool. Um, unfortunately, the author, Jonathan, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, it starts with a Z from Poland, uh, was just hired by Apple, so he sold it to F-Secure. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know if I want some corporate company now who has an agenda. F-Secure actually had this great quote a while back that said, uh, if something is free, it means you're the product, um, which I disagree with. All my tools are free. They're just, you know, there's no collection of user. You know, I'm just like, these are the tools I write for myself. I'm going to share them. So it will be interesting to see, because if the tool is free, that kind of implies that they're collecting stuff about you maybe, according to what they said previously, or if they sell it, ah, I really don't think security tools should be paid for. But the tool itself is great. Unfortunately, the author was hired by Apple, so he had to kind of sell it. So it's kind of in an ambiguous place. Um, but really great tool, though. Well, very well written. Any others? Yes? So if your malware injects a thread into an app like uh, FaceTime, for example, and reads the camera from there, is there anything you can do about it? Totally, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I like to caveat that any of these tools obviously can be bypassed with not that much sophistication, especially for people like yourselves. Um, you know, if something's specifically going after it, I don't think there's too much you can do, but exactly, that's a fundamental weakness. For example, with a tool like Oversight, um, you know, it'll still detect FaceTime, but the user will more than likely just click allow. Um, you could do some uh, kernel level analysis where you're monitoring the thread. Basically, I would probably look for injected threads first versus looking what the injected thread does because once it's kind of in there, it can, you know, do anything. It could, like, you know, spoof its backtrace and everything. Uh, but yeah, currently that's definitely a limitation. Um, and again, the tool is a user mode application, so you could always, like, if you're running as root, kill it and then do your injections and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a current limitation, so. Good question. Awesome. Lunchtime? Uh, almost. Almost. Oh, no. <laughs> <All right>. False promises. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Patrick.